taking up the reading in verse 13. And we'll read down to chapter 4 and verse 1. James 3, verse 13, page 1215. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth, since such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, and peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. So what causes heights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, the battle within you? Amen. Well, can I uh, just say at the outset that if this message sounds awfully like last week's message, that's because it does sound awfully like last week's <laughs> message, uh, primarily because I can't get it out of my head and I'm still trying to work my way around it to try and um, clearly see how it is that we can live really effective Christian lives. Um, so what I want to do is to return at least to that passage we read there in James chapter 3 uh, and verse 13 onwards and to consider once again the implications of what he has to say there. Um, I remember once at one of the EMA conferences um, the, the minister likened quite often a Christian to uh, you know those drinks dispensers that kind of stand in the corner of lobbies and things like that and you put your money in to get that something at the bottom uh, and he, was, he likened a Christian, he said, to a, one of those drinks dispensers. And he said, sometimes he says, you put the money in the top and nothing happens. So you have to hit it on the side to get it to drop, to get your stuff out the bottom. Uh, and sometimes that for us as Christians, we're putting the money in the slot, but nothing is happening. We're not taking things in. We're not really grasping what it is that God is saying to us through his words. So sometimes we have to be hit on the side of the head to try and get the stuff to drop down so that we might understand what is going on here. And, and I feel this at the moment, in, in a way, uh, I'm having to hit myself on the head, uh, to try and understand what these implications are, because it strikes me that quite often as Christians, we know the truth, but we don't actually fully apply it. And that's why there's so often problems in churches and in individual believers' lives, simply because the truth is not being put into practice. So forgive me for going over this again, or for exploring it a little bit further, but I think... Um, the certain important principles that we, we need to really take in because they are life-changing truths. Uh, and that's what we need to be looking for um, in, from the Word of God. So anyway, here in James chapter 3 and verse 13, we noted the other week how the James sets the ball rolling by asking this question, who is wise and understanding among you? Who is wise and understanding among you? That's the question he throws out to, you could say, the distant congregation, his far-flung congregation. Who is wise and understanding among you? He wants them to stop and think. Is this you? Are you wise and understanding? Well, to be able to say yes or no to that, we need to understand the... We need to be able to define what it means, what James means by wise and understanding. Well, first of all, as I said, to be wise and understanding is not a matter of intellect. It's not a matter of your IQ. And I would suggest that, from James's point of view, in fact, you may have a moderately low IQ, yet you can be immensely wise and understanding from a biblical perspective. So how can that be? Well, to understand that, I think we need to appreciate that James, James's own perception of what it means to be wise and understanding. And his understanding, and what it means to be wise and understanding is determined by what the Old Testament has to say, especially um, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 6. There, these are instructions that Moses is giving to the children of Israel on the, on the verge of going into the Promised Land, and he's instructing them on what they have to do if they're 
time in the promised land is going to be a time of blessing and of real encouragement and is, he tells them that the primary requirement that will be made of them with regard to God's laws as they enter the promised land is that they should observe them carefully he says because this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations so how can I tell whether I am wise and understanding well it will be seen by the degree to which the ways of God have been evidently implemented in my life I will reveal whether I am wise and understanding by the things that I do by the way that I live and so the degree to which I am wise and understanding will be directly proportionate to the degree to which I have imbibed and implemented God's word in my life in the end it doesn't matter whether the world thinks you're wise and understanding or not in their terms what matters is whether from God's perspective you can see that you are wise and understanding by the life that you live and indeed as I say from the world's point of view they might not deem you to be the sharpest knife in the box they might think that you live rather sad and boring lives as, as Christians they lack the excitement that the world has but the fact that it is you ultimately who is truly wise and understanding because you have grasped what really matters you will know when you go into work on Monday and you engage and chat with them and they tell you what they've been doing at the weekend and so on you will know they haven't grasped what life is really all about they are not wise they have no understanding they will tell you they've had a very exciting time but they will have not grasped the truth that really matters but you have you have put your faith in Jesus Christ you have come to see what really matters and what James is saying is the degree to which your wise and understanding will become clear in the life that you live it will be actually evident it will be a visual people will be able to see that you are wise and understanding by the way that you live and so we have James goes on to say no uh, can we go back one is there a number two ah oh, that's oh I got one missing yeah I got one missing um, right uh, Oh, that's because I haven't got a little lump beside it. That's why. Um, sorry, yeah. James will go. Well, it's all right, Duncan. You didn't do anything wrong there. Um, anyway, he will, he will say, in James's estimation, whether you will be wise and understanding will be evidenced by your good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Uh, and that's in verse 13 of James 3. He says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life. Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So wisdom will give, light, give rise to a good life. It must do. If the truth is rightly understood, it will effect change in who we are, the way we think, the things we do. It will effect change, visible change in who we are. And once again, you may find um, if you get if you in the grace of God get converted uh, your life changes and then those at work don't quite understand you know why why you don't do what you used to do well that's because there's a new wisdom on board you, you understand life differently and it, it's actually they see it visibly it's not you may tell them about your new faith but it actually becomes evident in the things that you do that's what really shows it backs up your words and so um, True wisdom is seen in what we do, the way we actually practically live. Um, so what is this new wisdom that brings about real change in our lives? Well, uh, James describes it. Uh, oh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you. What's your name? Duncan, isn't it? Thank you, Duncan. Uh, right, yes, that was the verse we were thinking, wasn't there? Um, the wisdom that changes our life is the wisdom that comes from above. It's first of all, pure then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Uh, that is the wisdom, says James, that really needs to be shaping our lives. The world has its own wisdom about what it thinks is right and good and clever and, and so on. But biblical wisdom brings us a message from above that is life-changing. 
And for James, of course, the main focus here, his initial concern, of course, was the impact that this wisdom should have upon the life of the church congregation, the believing community. Because as far as James is concerned, if this wisdom here is fully implemented by all the members of the community, it will give rise to a community where there will be a marked lack of any internal strife and discord because it will be a community of peacemakers. And because they are peacemakers, they will be those who sow in peace. And as a consequence, they will raise, as James goes on to say, a harvest of righteousness. Uh, James 3 and verse 18. So the wisdom from above, the way, the mindset you could say from above, will change the way that we as individuals think. And because we are peace-loving, it will give rise to a peaceful community. It must do it. If we've rightly absorbed the wisdom from above, it will change who we are. In a way, it's very similar to what Jesus says elsewhere. Um, he says regarding people, by their fruit you will know them. By their fruit you will recognize them. It's the fruit we bear, which is the real proof of what or who we are. It's no good saying one thing and bearing fruit that doesn't bear any relation to it. Our fruit will show who we really are. And sadly, for the community to whom James was writing, the harvest that they were reaping was not good. Because as we read here in the letter of James here, the Hartley community was torn by discord and disharmony. The reason for that was because their lives were not shaped by the wisdom that's from above, but rather, to use James's words, their lives were being shaped by a wisdom that was alarmingly earthly, earthbound, godless. It was, he said, unspiritual. In fact, he says, it's of the devil. That's, that's where it's come from. This way of thinking that is destroying the community. It's not come from God. It's come from, ultimately, the devil. And it gave rise to some pretty destructive behavior that resulted in serious etern internal strife and discord. James traces that to a series of toxic attitudes within the community. He re refers to bitter envy, selfish ambition, and destructive desires. So, if the wrong wisdom is in place, it will destroy a community of believers. So, wherever a Christian community is being blighted by internal strife and discord, then we can be sure that something has gone seriously wrong and that that community needs to be asking itself some serious questions. And that's what James goes on to do next. He's asking this community to look at themselves. And so in chapter 4 and verse 1, he asks them what causes fights and quarrels amongst you? What causes? Now, as we say, we noted last time, we say the question is not who is causing fights and quarrels among you, but what causes the fights and quarrels among you. And it's very important that, that we get this question right, otherwise we will get the answer wrong. You see, if the question was who causes these fights and quarrels, then of course I would be able to point, I, I'll point to the ceiling just in case any of you are, I'll be able to point at someone uh, and point the finger of blame and say, well I'll tell you who causes trouble and strife here. It's that person over there. They're the people who, who really wind me up with their silly little ways. And they irritate me to the point of impatience. Actually, their very presence provokes me. It causes me to become prickly and short and abrupt. And so if the question was, who causes strife and fights and quarrels? I would be able to point the figure. They, they are the cause. They are the cause. Um, and of course, if they weren't such annoying people, I wouldn't behave like this. It's only because they're annoying people that I behave like I do, that I react like I do to them. So, if the question was who, we would say, it's them. And James would go, wrong. It's not them. It's you. You're the problem here. Not, not them. And you can say, come off it, James. They are the problem. If they were nice, really nice, good, helpful, kind, thoughtful, appreciative Christians, I wouldn't have a problem with them. They're the problem. No, says James. You're the problem. Because, to go back, and that's why to go back to uh, his question, 
He doesn't ask who, but what. What is causing these fights and quarrels? What is it that can turn me into a prickly and irritable being? What can cause me to flare up in a moment? What can cause me to be dismissive of, of a particular person? Or to raise my eyebrows? You know, you know, you know. What can cause me to act like that? Well, it's my lack of self-control. That's why I act like that. It's my lack of patience with them. That's why I act like that. It's my lack of love towards them. That's why I act like that. And why might I lack those qualities of self-control or patience and love? Well, primarily because I have failed to nurture the fruit of the Spirit in my life. That's the problem. We, we noticed some time back, didn't we? We were talking about the fruit of the Spirit. I pointed out that it's not disease-resistant. The fruit can be blighted by any of these sins in our lives. You see, if my life was laden with the fruit of the Spirit, then I wouldn't get irritated or annoyed or angry. I wouldn't uh, wish them bad things. I wouldn't be selfish in my outlook. Because through the Spirit, I would actually have the mastery of myself so that my own self selfish inclinations, which are too often hijacked by a wayward heart and mind, would no longer be in the ascendancy in my life. You see, the bottom line is that the problem that I have with other people, with those people who wind me up, is actually fundamentally a problem that I have with myself. That's where the real problem is. The problem lies with me and my response. And to be honest, uh, it's no good me hoping that everybody will turn into nice, kind, petually pleasant, heartwarmingly considerate and gobsmackingly nice people because it's not going to happen. No good expecting everybody else to change so that you can be okay. As I said, if, if everybody was nice and kind and thoughtful and considerate, I wouldn't have an issue. I'd be one with them. There's no good thinking, well, if they change, then I'd be all right. No, simple fact is they're not going to change. I have to change myself that I might be all right, that I might cope with this, cope with the irritations, cope with the annoyances, cope with people being, um, anybody come with stupid, or, as they will be, but people will be. But I can't excuse myself because of everybody else. Because in the end, when I stand before God, he's not going to ask me about everybody else. He's only going to ask me about myself. I have to give account for my life, for what I have done, for the attitudes I have shown. So I am accountable for me. That is why we need to really grow the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Those out there won't change. They might change. Great. Wonderful. Um, but you cannot count on others changing so that you'll be alright. We have to change so that we will be alright, whatever anybody else might be like. And in a way, we may say that the, the Christian experience of salvation isn't just life-changing, it's nature-changing too. Through the work of the Spirit, our nature can be transformed so that the very presence of Christ may be manifested in us by the Spirit, giving rise to the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is the character of Christ in my own heart. And the only way the character of Christ will appear in my own heart is if I seek to nurture the presence of the Spirit who himself will bear this fruit in me. So if the present Spirit's presence is carefully nurtured, then these qualities, I would suggest, will flourish, will flourish in our lives. So the next question is, what might hinder their growth in our lives? Well, as we've thought over the week, recent months, as a lot of things can actually hinder that growth. And so to help illustrate that, I want to return to the illustration I used last week in which I likened our lives to a ship and I highlighted two things that determines 
the way that ship sails. The first thing is the crew that mans it, and the second thing is the flag that it sails under. And so first of all, once again, if you think of your life pre-conversion, at that point, your little ship of me, as it sailed across the sea, flew at its, on its mast, we said, a flag of convenience. You may recall how that, in the real world, apparently one of the reasons why ships fly a flag of convenience is because it allows them to avoid the regulations of the owner's country. They don't fly the flag of their owner's country, they fly the flag of some other country. It lets them get away with things. And pre-conversion, we will sail under a flag of convenience, or a flag of self-convenience, because we want to avoid the regulations of the owner's country. We don't want to live in his way. We don't want to do what he says. So we flag, fly a flag of our own convenience. And that, of course, is then reflected in the crew that ran the ship at that point. Pre-conversion, your crew, which was, say, your desires, your aspirations, your wants, your priorities, the inclination of your heart and of your mind, were focused really upon yourself. What God wanted was utterly irrelevant. The flag that flew from your mast was the flag of convenience. It was all about you. You were the captain of your ship. You went just where you wanted. But then there was the moment of conversion. And Jesus took control of the little ship of me. And he hauled down the flag of self-convenience. And he raised his own standard. And he set us on a new course. And he installed a new crew. Head of the crew was the Holy Spirit, ably supported by others. These fruits were planted at the same time. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and control. And initially, you could say the ship was transformed. And you had a happy ship, and all went well. It was a joy to be on board yourself. But then... Over time, you began to notice that some of the less desirable members of the old crew who'd sailed on your pre-conversion ship, some of the members of the old crew that you thought had gone began to reappear on deck again. And not only on deck, some of them appeared on the bridge and some of them took hold of the helm as well. And before you knew what was happening, you found yourself sailing off course again. The old crew started to take over the ship. And you're thinking to yourself, this isn't, well, this isn't how it's meant to be. I thought, as a Christian, it would all be different and, and I would just be able to sail happily without problem. But you found the old, some of the old thoughts, some of the old attitudes and practices and prejudices began to reappear again. You knew it wasn't right. You knew it shouldn't be like this. But you didn't know quite how to counter it. You knew there should be a new crew in charge of the ship because you kept on reading it and you had probably memorized it as well, the names of the new crew. But they didn't always seem to be around when you kind of wanted them. Instead of them, you got your old crew. Took you off in the wrong direction. And it seems as if you were powerless to stop the re-emergence of the old crew with its old wayward ways. The question was, is what's to be done? Quite often, it's not unusual to find Christians flying God's flag but being run by the old crew. The old crew. Still on board, still doing this. Not as powerfully, perhaps, as before, although they can take over the ship. If so, we've seen... How many Christians do you know have almost sunk without trace because the old crew took over? The old crew is quite dangerous. So what's to be done with this danger? And it's constantly there, taking the helm, just taking over your life momentarily, just putting you a little bit off, off course. What's to be done? Well, this is the point when we have to come face to face with the fact that we need to retain, regain control of the ship. This is the crew that should be in charge. They should be running the ship. So that whenever you encounter me, you encounter my crew. You don't encounter irritability, you don't encounter impatience, you don't encounter any lack of love. You encounter the true crew who run 
the ship. God's flag fluttering from the mast. So, how do we regain control? Because quite often we have lost it. How do we regain control? Well, if the problem is going to be sorted, and we have to want to sort this problem, it will not sort itself. We have to want to have the true crew in charge. So what are we going to do? Well, as I say, if we are convinced, well, we need to be convinced, rather, that the old crew, with its wayward ways, has no place on board. All right, that's the first thing. The old crew, with its wayward ways, has no place on board the ship that we now sail on. We need to be convinced of that. I don't think we always are. Because we're, we're all too prone, I fear, um, to leave the old crew still on the payroll. They're still around. They're still on, sh on board. And we actually might be quite protective towards them. We may... Do you know anybody who gets right up your nose? How long have they been doing that? Years, probably. Because they haven't changed. You have trouble handling them. Now, what are you going to do with the old crew that acts as the old crew that gets annoyed with them and impatient and irritated and frustrated by them and drives you around the bend? It's the old crew who react like that. It's not the new crew. Not the crew of love or any others because love would embrace that person and love them. So what are you going to do with that old crew? Well, one of our problems is we can be quite protective. Because I, how often have you heard a Christian say, I know I shouldn't think that. Or I know I shouldn't do that, but... And we keep the old crew on the payroll. And they're still running about the ship. Changing the... I'm going to say tack of the sail, but it's probably the wrong word, Bill. But uh, just fiddling around with things on board. But we need to deal with the old crew. It's no good saying, well, that's how it is. The old crew's been around for years and I don't think I'm ever going to... Quite often we'll say it's, un it's unrealistic to expect you can get shot of the old crew. I am who I am. This is human nature. You can't expect me to be like that before I arrive in heaven. And so we leave the old crew on board, still influencing who we are and damaging, restricting the presence of this crew. So what's to be done? Well, in all honesty, there needs to be a bloodbath on board. There needs to be a bloodbath on board. All the old crew, nice as they are, and I know we've been together for many, many years, all the old crew needs to be put to death. Ruthlessly eradicated. The ship purged of all their wayward ways, with no mercy shown, no quarter given. You know, I think quite often if we, we do wrong, we don't, uh, well, we know it's wrong because it's not right. But instead of ruthlessly dealing with it, we send it to the naughty step or something. Just go on the naughty step for a little while. But then it comes back in again, you know, like your child, you sit on the naughty step, about three minutes later, they come back through the door, all innocent. And, and we do this with these, our irritations and things like that. We don't deal with them. We, we just put them on the naughty step, but then they come back into our life. But we need to show them no mercy, no quarter, so that by the time we have finished, none of the old crew are be to be found on deck. None of the old crew, in fact, are to be on board, so that the little ship of me can be crewed solely by the Holy Spirit. That's what we're working at, and we have to be ruthless in it. We need to have a ship crewed by love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. So, just three final verses that point to the ruthlessness that's actually needed of us. Uh, first one, ooh, big one. Colossians 3 uh, and verse 5. Paul here ends up by emphasizing the need of, of love amongst God's people. But he says there, what verse are we on? 
3 verse 5. Yeah, where does it start? Put to death. How do you put something to death? Nicely. You can't. Putting something to death is, is, is hard, difficult thing to do. You're not just standing by and it's dying of its own accord. These things won't die of their own accord. They live on unless we put them to death. And so Paul says, put to death. They haven't been put to death for you. They're still there. You've got the resources to put them to death, which is the Holy Spirit. But you must put them to death. Whatever belongs to your flesh or earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Rid yourselves of, throw them overboard, make them walk the plank. Just get rid of them off the ship. No longer in your employ. Anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which has been created in knowledge in the image of its creator. In the image of its creator. New self. Imaged in the fruit of the spirit. Um, next one, Galatians 5 and verse... 24, Paul says there, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. Now, this once again, it's the believers who have crucified. It's not that that was crucified for you. Believers here are called upon to crucify the sinful nature with its passions and desires. How do you crucify something nicely? It's a bloody end to something. Nailed down and killed to be got rid of. And some of these things, you, you, know, you, you, have your, you know yourself, you know your nature, you, you know the things that might begin to pop up again, like we were saying, um, the grace of God teaches us to say no to all ungodliness, and I said you have to say no every day. Time and time again you have to say no, no, because these things have this awful knack of popping back to life. You have to crucify them again and again to get rid of them. I remember when we were at Bible college, we lived in a, a house, had cockroaches, Hated. You went down to the toilet at night, which was out the back, downstairs. You had to go across the kitchen floor where the cockroaches would come out to play at night. And so I always used to go downstairs with a shoe in my hand. And when you saw the cockroach, you hit it with all the possible force you could to try and flatten the thing. And they were incredibly resistant. They would not go. They, you, you, know, you could tread on them and all sorts of things. Next morning they'd gone, they were carried off by their friends, I don't know. But they were very resistant. Paul says, crucify. Can you think of a more violent end or something? He doesn't say, say, put it on the naughty step. Whenever it's a problem, crucify it. Crucify it. That's how serious this issue is. It's kind of them or you. Crucify them, he says. And then finally, Romans 8 and verse 13. If you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body. Two deaths and one crucifixion. That's the only way you get rid of the crew, the old crew on board. Ruthless dismissal of the old crew. And that's the only way that the new crew will flourish. It would be very nice if the new crew would take over the ship and do it all for you. But you have to work with them. And working with them involves you in crucifying certain characteristics of your behaviour. Putting it to death. Finishing it off. Making sure it doesn't come back. Not keeping it on board, but getting rid of it. Not accepting it at all. Deliberately getting shot of all that's wrong. So, the point I simply want to make is thinking about is not accepting. I think we've become too accepting of our weaknesses. We don't accept them. But we seek to ensure that the new crew flourishes. And we actively seek to ensure that the old crew is put to death and thrown overboard. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this salvation that you have given us. Father, it's very clear to us that the job is not yet finished. We are not yet home. But Lord, we are journeying home and in that journey we pray that you would help us through your spirit, we may know the 
presence, a powerful presence of that new crew on board our life. And Father, that old crew that perhaps we put up with, perhaps we've never really got rid of, Lord, help us to be ruthless with it. Help us to take it seriously as a threat to life on board. Help us, Lord, to crucify it, to put it to death. That our lives may clearly reflect the fact that we do truly have wisdom and understanding that is from above. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.